Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Uh, today's session, uh, I'm presenting, I'm Adam, and uh, the uh, presentation is on selecting targets for beginners, intermediates, and advanced imagers. Um, and wow, had I, had I thought about the, to the topic's name before I went into it, I probably would have changed the topic's name, but I'll get into a little bit of that while, while you see, uh, uh, when I get into the presentation. But for now, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. And if you guys don't see the screen as I'm expecting or as I'm explaining, just tell me. But I'm going to full screen mode, so you should see my entire screen. Jumping over to PowerPoint, and now you should see my PowerPoint presentation on my screen and not me. Um, so like I said, today's session is on selecting targets for beginners, intermediate, and advanced imagers. And it's, you know, it's funny, the, 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 the title made me kind of get into a bit of the philosophy of what's a beginner, intermediate, and advanced imager, and that's, I don't know, in my mind, a bit of a waste, but I guess I had to do some of it because uh, th there are some rules for beginners. Maybe less confusing when it, oh, did I lose you? Hmm, what went wrong there? No, you're... Still you guys it. still see my screen, the right screen? Yeah, it's still there. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so maybe it's not so confusing for uh, beginners, but for intermediate and advanced imagers, how do you separate them? It's a little bit, it is a little bit confusing. Beginners, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of coming down to the philosophy where beginners can pick from a specific list, and... Uh, trying to help them along, I think we have kind of a specific responsibility to give them images that still give them that wow factor, but um, are achievable to a beginner without spending all of that money and putting every all that effort into it. So I'm going to jump right into the presentation. I'm going to show you my first image, and it's a moon. It's the moon, and uh, you, you probably all have done the same thing, but I, I didn't know what I was getting into when I started with this, and I took this shot of the moon, and I was blown away. I had no idea I could take a photograph like this, and I was so happy. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's he talking? It's a moon shot. We're deep sky guys. We're deep space guys. We don't really shoot the moon. And I'm kind of the same way. Uh, uncomfortable topic when, when it comes up, uh, because my daughter's name is Luna. But uh, I guess besides that... Uh, I, I, normally, I wouldn't say I'm a moon guy. Maybe we should have named her Nova. But that, that was my choice. But um, okay, but so okay, so the, the moon. You have to do it. You have to try it. You put your DSLR on your telescope and you take that shot, and you've impressed yourself. But what what's a deep space? What's a beginner's deep space object look? Deep sky object look? And this is actually my first deep space photograph, and I did stack right off the bat, so this is a bunch of probably 30 second exposures, and this is of the Owl Nebula, and what a terrible target to start out with. It's dim, it's probably the, one of the worst, well not, not the worst planetary nebula to pick, but one of the worst ne planetary nebulas to pick. Um, it's, even, even my recent pictures of it are not so good, and I don't know why I picked it. I don't know what prompted me to pick the Owl Nebula, but I did. And I was blown away by this particular photograph. Even today, I'm pretty impressed by it. And just looking around, I see the vignetting, but I wasn't taking flats at the time. So it, it kind of looks like a, a relatively good photo for what I, what I was doing. It's not always that good. This is my third image that I ever took. This is of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and this is a terrible, awful photo. Uh, the vignetting really shows because it was a dim object, so I really had to stretch it. And I really also had to, uh, well, I didn't have to, but I clipped the black point. I didn't apply proper gradient removal. So, but, but I was blown away by this image. I, I showed this to my coworkers, I showed this to my family, and they were pretty impressed by it. And I think that it's more the, the subject. I mean, we're looking at a galaxy, and, and we, as Alex said last week, we forget about it. We're, 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 this is M51, and I, 
uh, my vignette, I, I allowed some vignetting in there. I didn't do proper gradient removal and this and that. But oh my God, this is and look at this beautiful galaxy. So I was blown away by it at the time. And at the same time, I think that beginners can go into a a few safe targets and knowing they want to take specific things out of them, get a lot out of them. And uh, those targets uh, I'm going to get to in. Uh, a few slides, but there are a few beginning struggles or beginner struggles that as they go through these few 12 as, I, as I've listed targets, uh, and, and it's not just 12 targets. Somebody suggested another one that I thought was a great idea, but I didn't put it on just because I didn't have enough time. But there are 12 pretty good targets that are bright enough for, that you can really make them look impressive, but also that you can get certain things out of. Uh, when you're a beginner struggling, your struggles are going to be elongated stars. It might be polar alignment. It might be guiding. Your struggles might be focus. You might need a button off mask. It might just be the, your obsessive compulsiveness. How frequently do you focus? Noise, which can be fixed by longer exposure time, calibration processing. Um, all these things are things you're going to have to learn. And, and it's going to take a certain number of outings before you learn this. Maintaining dynamic range. Determining and using good exposure length and not clipping and processing. Well, there's, there's two things there. First of all, when it comes to your acquisition, you have pretty much one shot under clear skies. So you really want to make sure you know what you're doing going into that. When it comes to processing, you have a lot of chances. So you, you can mess up a few times, but um, the better your plan is, the more achievable the object you select. I think the better results you're gonna you're gonna have. So those are your struggles that you're gonna see as a beginner, and uh, keeping them in mind, you're gonna proceed to need to know a few other things. Adam. Yes. Hi. Um, we've got some new folks coming along here, and uh, I would like to remind them of how we do a few things um, here. One is that uh, because of limitations in bandwidth, it's always good to uh, uh, to cut out your video and your uh, turn off your microphone so that you don't uh, interrupt other things in, um, inadvertently. So if you've uh, got your video that's running, um, unless you're actually going to be saying something, just shut your video down and shut your microphone off if you're in the room itself. Also, there's a couple of functions that you should have apps that are over on the left-hand side of your screen if you've loaded them, and um, uh, they give you a column over on the right side. One is comments and the other is Q&A. And we're monitoring that because there are some people that can't get in on the, uh, the home, the, the room itself. And so please, uh, if you've got questions that you want to ask Adam as he's going along, um, uh, go ahead and put your uh, questions over there on the side. Now I've muted a couple of people here, may not realize that they're muted, um, but there's a little microphone down there if, if, you're, if you've been muted. And it, and it helps keep the flow of the presentation going. Sorry for the interruption, um, but I needed to get that stuff out. Okay, Adam? Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> there are no questions yet as in, the, in the queue. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the things that you're going to start to familiarize yourself with as a beginner is going to be the image scale. And you've heard me say probably that I hate the term magnification because image scale really is the best way to refer to how large something is. Um, Magnification is like saying how many thumbs wide is it at arm's length, and depends on how long your arm it, arm is, and a lot of things come into factor. Image scale is how big it looks. So in image scale, we use degrees, arc minutes, and arc seconds. And when you're looking at a chart or a list of objects, you're going to see those listed. And when you get down to arc seconds, objects that are arc seconds wide, you're, you're talking about small objects. When you're talking about degrees, you're talking about large objects, and uh, they're only, I'm not going to say they're only a few, but uh, I think amateur astrophotographers tend to ignore a lot of the very large objects just because uh, we're, we're hooked on the kind of magnification telescope thing, but you'll see some amazing photos uh, of some larger objects. But what, what is, some objects are large, what's large? Some objects are small, what's small? The moon and the sun are common objects, and they are uh, 31, <laughs> ironically, the moon and the sun are roughly the same size, or look roughly the same size. Uh, that's why eclipses are so beautiful, and um, 
it, it's just that kind of a coincidence of nature. Uh, we, we know the sun's much larger than the moon, but it's just much more distant. But they are roughly the same size, about 31 to 32. The, the moon changes a bit more than the sun. The sun stays pretty stable. Uh, uh, arc minutes wide. The Andromeda Galaxy, the famous Andromeda Galaxy, is 190 arc minutes wide. So it's it's many moons wide, seven, eight moons wide. And people don't realize that. When I show people my photo of Andromeda, they think magnification. And they don't realize that it's actually taking up that much space in the sky. And uh, this one image uh, taken by Adam Locke and Tim Puckett, uh, made a 2006 APOD, and I'll tell you, I remember this image for a long time because when I asked myself whether that really was a galaxy that I was seeing naked eye when I was camping before I got into astronomy, and I found out it was, and it was Andromeda, I was just amazed by it because I, I thought to myself, Campia looks too large, and uh, it, it turned out I, I really was seeing a galaxy just with my naked eyes, but I was in dark enough skies. So uh, th that always amazes me. A tool you can use uh, to see what common objects are going to look like in your camera and telescope combination is the Sky at Night field of view calculator. And uh, you can Google Sky at Night FOV and you'll get right there. And it's a good way, uh, it's a good way to do a few things. Uh, determine your framing of a particular object, see what it's going to look like, or uh, consider buying particular cameras or optical tubes and see what your field of view is going to be. So that's a very handy tool and it's a great one to point out. Another thing you want to know about uh, photographing deep sky objects is that they have a particular brightness. The, the Sun has an apparent magnitude of negative 27, Jupiter negative 2, Vega mag, magnitude positive 5, I really screwed up the way I uh, put those dashes in there. I guess not, but uh, naked eye limit, they say, is magnitude 6.5, although I think that's arguable. Um, Pluto, magnitude 14. So you can see the lower the number or the negative numbers are much brighter, the higher are much dimmer. And then we look at deep sky objects, and you see the Orion Nebula, magnitude 4, the Hercules Cluster, magnitude 5.8, the Dumbbell Nebula, magnitude 7.5. Now... Oh, this is great. We have a way to determine the brightness of objects. This is awesome. Well, it's not so simple. It actually doesn't work so well. The problem is that the brightness is spread over the entirety of the object. And a better way to measure it would be surface brightness. But there aren't great surface brightness measurements of every object. Or if there are, someone could correct me because I haven't found great surface brightness of objects. Um, and if so, it would be better to categorize photography objects or astrophotography objects probably by surface brightness. Um, but, uh, and when I say that, it's rather than measuring in, in magnitude, which works for a point source object, measured in magnitude per square arc second. So it's the brightness over a particular uh, square distance. Um, and that kind of averages out the brightness. Uh, it averages out the bright and dim parts of the object. Uh, and as I said, DSOs just aren't as bright as the magnitude would imply. A great example of this is the Triangulum Galaxy, a pair of magnitude of 5.7, which is relatively bright. But if anyone's ever photographed this, they know it's dim. This is a tough object. Uh, you can get the center of it pretty nicely, but um, the outer arms of it can be very difficult. I have to show this image. Uh, I'm afraid that you guys can't see the uh, the photographer on the bottom. This is Rogelio Bernal Andreo, an APOD from 2010, and this is an iconic image in my mind. And this demonstrates perfectly what both of those points, and probably what would be a great beginner misconception. This is uh, Bernard's loop. So yes, this is the Orion constellation. This is 10 degrees not 10 minutes, not 10 seconds, this is 10 degrees across. This takes up a large chunk of the sky. So think about that, you can't see any of that stuff. You can barely make out Orion, uh, the Orion Nebula when you're uh, looking at a naked eye. You can see some of the brighter stars. But um, this is both dim and massive. 
and this is kind of the epitome of the misconception. Uh, we really are gathering photons over time, very dim objects, we're brightening them, uh, and I just love this image. Uh, it's a 2010 APOD, so I, this one stands out in my mind. I would love to quote, try and replicate this somehow. So I have compiled what I'd say is a good beginner list. Uh, I broke it up by summer and winter, and I, I'm not sure I got all these right, to be honest. And, and my beginner list can be uh, repaired by uh, future uh, revisions because uh, my summer and winter kind of is different. I, I, I can stay up late sometimes, so I'm not sure if that considers it. But either way, uh, going into it, uh, you'll see I have it divided by planetary nebula, uh, the dumbbell in the ring, great planetary nebula, uh, if you have a long focal length setup, uh, clusters, the Hercules cluster, M13, uh, nebulae, the Eagle Nebula, and the Veil Nebula, uh, galaxies, the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51, Andromeda Galaxy, M31, uh, that's for summer. For winter, the Orion Nebula, the Crab Nebula, which is actually, I believe, a supernova remnant. So, still a nebula, but maybe not. Should be, shouldn't be categorized there, I'm not sure. Uh, clusters, the double cluster of three of these galaxies. And what I'm going to show you right now is actually uh, some, of the, some of my images, pretty much of the first beginner's list. And these are images that I took on the first three or so years of my imaging career. Uh, so you'll see some problems with them and uh, but these are the things you're working through uh, in uh, in your uh, imaging and the first one's the dumbbell nebula and you can see what looks like field rotation in the corners and I struggled with this for a long time but actually I determined that the focal reducer I was using looked a lot like field rotation and uh, when I finally got my edge I didn't worry about anything else I didn't have any problems with field rotation I was good at polar alignment really good because that's what I thought my issue was um, so one of those things you're going to be working through your problems but this will be get you a pretty good image in the meantime the ring nebula this is a bright object I think this was 15 second exposures and maybe 30 of them or something like that uh, still no flats but uh, pretty impressive image this is a year later, the Ring Nebula. So a short period of time later, I was doing a lot better. I was getting myself under control, and uh, even my processing skills were improving. Uh, this is my third image ever, the Hercules Cluster. Look at the background there. It's awful. It's red. Um, but I don't know. At the time, I was really proud of it. A month after that particular image, I took it. I took the same image of the same thing and I did a lot better color wise, my background's black, so I, I really improved just in one month. Uh, this is the end of, this is about the summer. I bought my telescope in April. My first post on cloudy nights was April 13th, I think, and I think I had my telescope by about uh, 420, 423 or so were my first images. And uh, I started pumping them out. This was in the summer. This was the first summer. So three months later, I took the Eagle Nebula. I realized that you can set up under a tree if you don't need to look straight up because I really had to get at a particular angle to get the Eagle Nebula. And I also realized that you should never set up under a pine tree because I was cleaning sap off my uh, corrector after that. Uh, the sap, some of it never came off until I sold it. So... Veil Nebula. Now, I took this one actually recently. Um, my other Veil Nebula weren't ready for presentation, but I, I like this image and I wanted to show it off. Uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy. This was one of my first images as well. Actually, the I reshot this in the summer. I did a lot better when I did it this way uh, with a focal reducer. But this makes for an impressive image. And you, you're a beginner now, so you're going to be working through all this stuff. Um, you can see I, I kept relatively tight stars. Of course, my exposures were short enough. I clipped out the background, so who knows how bad it really was, but um, I was able to make get a pretty decent image. Remember, I started in alt as I didn't have a wedge at this point, so I was really limited to short exposures. Um, this was a couple years in, maybe three years in. I had gotten my William Optics, my refractor, and I realized this is a lot easier. 
it's a lot easier to use a refractor than a long focal length SCT. All of a sudden, I have good stars. I have good signal to noise ratio. I, uh, everything was easier. And Andromeda makes another great beginner image. The Orion Nebula. Now, this causes controversy. I put it as the first object on my list. This is the best object for a beginner to shoot. Why? Because, in my opinion, uh, even if you blow out the trap, the trapezium, the center four stars there, you're going to have a pretty nice image. You're going to show off a lot of the extended nebula. If you don't blow out the trap, you're going to have a pretty nice image because it's, there's a lot of pretty cool stuff going on in there. Um, so my, uh, if you ask me my opinion on the Orion Nebula, I'm going to say oh, the Orion Nebula is a great beginner object. And it's a very difficult intermediate to advanced object when you're trying to maintain the dynamic range and layer in the bright spots with the, the dim spots. But that's my overall opinion. I know it, it caused uh, a stir on uh, cloudy nights, but we, we, we kind of talked through it. But uh, since, we, it, since it had come up in misconceptions earlier, I thought I'd bring that up. Crab Nebula. It's a slightly dimmer target, but a, a good one. Uh, it's an interesting target. There's an iconic Hubble photograph of it, but you can also get a pretty nice photograph of it yourself. And uh, for that reason, I've got the crab on there, M1. One of the, another one of the first that I took with my wide field scope, the double cluster, and I happened to catch Comet Hartley with this. And uh, I believe I have an animation of Hartley going through this, but uh, a great one for clusters. Clusters are really good when you're trying to preserve your star shape get good at star color uh, because that's what that's the main focal point of your image between galaxies nebulae clusters planetaries there's different processing techniques and even some different acquisition techniques you're gonna have to use galaxy neb nebulae need long time a lot of time clusters don't need as much time but they might need more delicate color processing planetary might need very short amount of time um, but you may also have to let stack in layers of stuff. Uh, the same with some diff more difficult objects. Uh, this is an awful shot of the Pleiades. Uh, this is the SCT. This is my old SCT with the reducer. Look at the ghosting. Uh, look at I don't even know what that is coming off the uh, the central star, but uh, lets me learn the limits of my system. Uh, maybe I do have to stay away from bright stars like this. Okay, I, I understand that. So. Gets me a little bit further in my in my learning skills. M81 and M82. <clears throat> All right, I always I always get these confused. I think M82 is a cigar galaxy on the left there. Maybe I have it confused with the other one, but a great image because you can get them both in one field with most telescopes. Not not an edge eight inch at f10, but I believe with the reducer you can get it pretty darn close. Um, but M82, the cigar, is very bright. You can get a great image of just that. M81 is very dim, and it's a difficult galaxy to get a good image of. But when you put them together in the field, you can get a great image. And we'll revisit these because there's some other stuff buried in these that you probably wouldn't know. Uh, but there you go. That's, that's, a, that's M82, the cigar galaxy, and that's what I was talking about. This, this galaxy itself is pretty dra dramatic. Alex posted a great image last week that Tony Hallis did. Insane. Uh, made it look like an entirely different galaxy, but it's just a beautiful object. Uh, I'm going to stop right now and just ask if there are any questions. Yeah, I, I just checked things out. I don't think there are any on either the group chat or on the uh, Q&A. Okay. That's it. We're, we're, we're doing good on either case, so keep on keeping on there. Okay. Um, intermediate images. And now this is like the part where I really get uncomfortable because I don't want to characterize what where people are. But you know what? I have to. I kind of have to to make the make this point. So intermediate imagers understand how to work how to work their systems. They can reliably get good enough polar alignment. Can go out and get sky limited exposures. Um, most of the time, with with some exceptions, can reliably get round stars. Starting to learn the limits of their skies and equipment. Starting to push the capabilities of their skies and equipment. And that's kind of what you want to be doing. You want to know exactly where you have to stop and where you have to start, where what's safe ground. If you want to go out and get an, a great image, an impressive image, 
well, you can't shoot the dinosaur. Adam, I don't know if it's with yes. everybody else, but you're really starting to break up a lot. I'm sorry, I'm starting to break up. My mic is breaking up. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Although now it stopped, so. <laughs> All right. Tell me, tell me how it goes. I'm not sure if I can do anything. If it gets so bad that you can't hear anything, just let me know again. Um, I'll try and speak. I don't okay. know, slowly or something. Um, so, you're you're I'm not sure what the deal is, but it's kind of funky. All right. Well, let, let's see. Give me give me like two slides and a slide or two, and we'll go back to it. Um, so you're learning the limits of your skies, and uh, you want to come out with an excellent photograph, you need to know what your limits are and what your capabilities are. Uh, you're improve you, when it comes to the targets you're picking, you've taken your beginner images, so you can take these new images, you can take the same images and see how much further along you've come. You've got better focus this time, tighter stars, improved framing. You're going deeper. You're probably taking longer integration times. Your processing is getting better. At the same time, you can choose to move on to new targets. Are you finding you like a particular object? Does your equipment support that interest? And um, I recently uh, came across a couple tools that as an intermediate imager, I think become very handy because they let you sort by particular types of objects, by their difficulty, but and of course by your lat la latitude and longitude, um, and a few other things. One is Tonight Sky, and I, I'm sorry I should have had the website here, but it, Google Tonight Sky and it'll bring it up. Uh, when you type in everything and you search, it gives you a list which gives you pretty much everything you could need, name of the object. Uh, brightness, size, constellation it's in, um, a few other, uh, some other information that might help you out, and uh, this is a great tool. Also, Deep Sky Object Browser, dso-browser.com, uh, is another one that I recently uh, discovered, and uh, this is very cool. It also tells you the maximum elevation of the object which can be really helpful. Um, I don't know, is my microphone still breaking out? Uh, we, took a poll while, we took a poll while you were talking and, and most of the people think it's actually working pretty good uh, as, as you're going along. Okay. I guess somebody's still having a problem with it. So Yeah, I do hear someone in the background, so someone's microphone yeah. might not be muted. Um, who is it, David? David, could you mute yourself? I can't there see. We go. Yeah, because once they pick up, it mutes me out most of the time, and that okay. could be one of the issues. Um, yeah, so this DSO browser, it also gives you great images of the object. So another great resource for selecting objects. Um, yes, go ahead. Oop, not hearing you now. I, was that, uh, should I continue on? I'm sorry, I can't see you guys because I'm stuck in PowerPoint. You're good to go. Okay. Um, astronomy catalogs. You know, there are a million astronomy catalogs out there. The common ones being the Messier List, the Sharp List catalog, uh, ARPS catalog of interacting galaxies, Barnard's catalog of dark nebulae, the Vandenberg catalog of reflection nebulae, Herschel 400, and I've been through all of these looking for objects. Um, there's, it's funny because I'd love to have all of these printed out with great CCD images of the objects, but we're still working our way through them. Not, not all of them are photographed uh, in, w with respectable photographs. So it's funny, you could pick a catalog and really do some good work on it, as people are doing. Um, my way of finding out, finding objects, what you saw on cloudy nights. I, I haven't quite got to the point where I'm looking for the most obscure objects, but it's a great place to look because we all share the same sky, we all share the same season. Most people post their objects in season. 
few people lose objects on their hard drive and then find them, but for the most part, what people are posting is stuff they're just doing now. Not that you want to steal someone's framing, but I know we've done it, um, and it's going to happen. It's always going to happen, so it's just the way it's going to be. And I'm actually going to go right through kind of a round robin of what I'm going to call a bunch of good intermediate targets. I'm not going to go through the constellations these are in or the um, really many of the details of them. I mean, it's just going to kind of be a round robin of photos. But um, these are a lot of my images. And for, the, for some of the others, uh, first of all, you can see the list linked on Cloudy Nights. And I'm going to put it back into this session. But uh, if, you, if you're interested in just looking at a bunch of targets, this is where we're going to see them. So the Horsehead Nebula, iconic, uh, taken by the Hubble. And this I did recently, and I was really happy with it shortly after I got my CCD camera. North American Nebula. This is one that we're all going to shoot. Uh, I didn't get a chance to shoot the RGB for this, so it's just all in monochrome. But this is H-alpha. The Rosette Nebula. Um, I love the way this dust looks. I can make out all these little objects, like a family skipping across there, and a dog, and all sorts of stuff. But uh, I love this particular object, and I'm working on a nice project on this object that I hope will turn out well. Heart Nebula. This is inside of the Heart Nebula. Heart Nebula is actually a large object and a great beginner target, what, or beginning to advanced target where you're uh, starting to do H alpha. You're starting to get into uh, some of the deeper nebula, but it's a large object, so a faster, smaller telescope will really take advantage of it. Uh, I've gone inside of it here, so I'm a slower, longer focal length telescope, just picking up that inside um, dust, but. Uh, that's just the way I photographed it. That's a bunch of my recent photographs, which you're going to see a few of right off the bat. Soul Nebula, right next to the Heart Nebula, the same thing inside of it. Uh, and I'm really finding that I like these, these types of images where you're really getting a lot of detail out of it. The Elephant Trunk Nebula, the same thing inside of IC1386, uh, 1386, I believe. Um, forget off the top of my head. Uh, I see 1396, um, but great one. Another one, this is inside of it, but this is a much larger target. Uh, so you can take this with the wide field scope and get a great image out of it. And again, we recommend newcomers, wide field scopes. You're going to get really impressive images right off the bat. You're not going to be struggling. Wizard Nebula, an intermediate object, uh, but a nice one. Um, this is a longer focal length scope, so this is a smaller target, but uh, definitely impressive. I can see the wizard. I think we're all into wizards every every time a new Harry Potter movie comes out. Uh, Pelican Nebula. Um, as you become more of an advanced imager, you might find a particular type of object you like. And inside of the Pelican Nebula is a Herbig Haro object, which is where uh, jets come off uh, a newly formed star when it's rotating a particular way. And these objects are, uh, I'm not going to say common, but you find them in predictable places. And uh, you tend to see them around box globules and, uh, or, or around uh, nebula where there are box globules at the base. So they're, uh, you kind of recognize them. And I just think it's an interesting object or type of object. Cocoon Nebula, another great photo. It can be done wide field, as you see here, or long focal length to pick up the center. Crescent Nebula, my long focal length version of it. This is narrow band, kind of a more recent one. Uh, the California Nebula. Um, this is a wide field, great object. Uh, good for beginners. Uh, beginners to intermediates that are working on H-alpha. Um, most H-alpha targets aren't going to be great for beginners. It's going to it's going to be when you start to push your exposures longer that you're going to be able to reveal that. So when I say beginners, not the ultimate beginners, for those ultimate beginners, again, I recommend sticking to that list, that list of 12 objects. You're going to impress your coworkers. Uh, you're going to impress your family. Uh, you're, you, might, you might get a few likes on Astro Bin, and you might, impress, uh, you might get a few likes on Cloudy Nights. Uh, but to really start impressing the Cloudy Nights guys, you're going to be pushing your exposures longer. That's, that's what you're going to get out of it. Uh, then when you start, want to start impressing the NASA guys, you have to do even more than that. Um, 
This is Matt Ratter's image. I borrowed an image from him because my Trifid Nebula image wasn't presentable, and he did a great job on it. Great star color here, uh, but another great image. Uh, even this is one that even could handle the beginner, but uh, again, I, I say stick to the bright objects, hone your skills. Uh, Cave Nebula. This is becoming a more advanced object. This is pretty dim, um, but uh, you can pick up the central core of it. But I'd say intermediate to advanced. M101. Uh, not a bad beginner object. This is one of my first photographs, uh, so you can still see the banding going across. Uh, I didn't do a great job on this, but I, again, I was jumping up and down when I took it. The Leo triplet, M6566 and NGC3628. Anytime you can show galaxies like this in a field, you're, you're I don't know, you're going to be impressed. I was really impressed with this. Um, I have this hanging in my bathroom. I look at it every morning before I take my shower. But uh, just blown away by how cool it is. All those galaxies, all those larger galaxies in one field. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is gonna impress the coworkers and some of the cloudy nights guys. Although we've seen the the framing before, if you can do pretty good on the color and the detail, uh, we'll give you props. Josh, I don't know if you're out there, but you did a great job on this one. Uh, the Deerlick Group and Stefan's Quintet. And uh, this is a wider field view, but the color on this is awesome. And uh, I had to show off this image because I put this on my intermediate list. Uh, just ones you have to try. Uh, here's my rendition of the Deer Lick group shortly after I started. And uh, you can see the, the light pollution and everything. Not, not a great shot, but uh, you're, you're seeing all of my, you're, you're going to see a lot of my images. So uh, I wasn't great when I started, and I got better and better. Uh, the Sunflower Galaxy M63, uh, great image here, uh, beautiful galaxy, okay image here. I was getting my star color down, I was starting to get my galaxy color. I did a pretty good job on color on this, but I can see some noise in the background. Problem I'll have eternally. The Black Eye Galaxy, I was really excited when I took this image. I didn't expect to be able to take an image with such good detail, and kind of this look to it. Posted it on Astro Bin, and I was getting a ton of likes. And then, um, I forget his name, but one of the Italian guys posted a blazing, insanely amazing version of this and won Image of the Day with it, and I was just kind of blown away. Uh, I had no... I, I, I figured he reprocessed Hubble data, but he didn't. It was all his, so that was pretty cool. Uh, NGC 4565, I believe this is uh, one of the other galaxies in Andromeda, and it's an edge-on spiral galaxy, so... Just an impressive one to take. M106, uh, another nice galaxy. A little bit dim in the outer region. So what you're going to be doing as an intermediate is trying to reveal more of this galaxy, reveal more of the arms of it. <clears throat> and that's how you're going to see how good you're doing. Uh, Richard Flynn from the forums. Uh, this is his, The Whale and the Hockey Stick. And uh, I don't know, the name creates the image for this one, because it does look like a whale, and it does look like a hockey stick. Maybe it looks more like a whale than a hockey stick, but another great target. This one's by Mad Ratter, the Sombrero Galaxy, iconic. Uh, there was an iconic Hubble photo of it, and you can take this photo from your house. Um, I'm always impressed by that. That's the day that I realized that you can photograph galaxies from your driveway was the day that I ran out and bought my telescope because uh, it just blows me away. Uh, this is mine. Markarian's chain. This is a group of galaxies. So you're showing a lot of galaxies in one field. This is a coworker impressor, definitely. Uh, and I remember taking this image because this was probably the hottest night I've ever gone out and imaged. I thought I was standing next to a bonfire while taking this. I, that's what it felt like. Kept looking over, thinking I was going to fall into the fire, and uh, there was no fire there. Last summer, when I had my CCD camera, I made it to darker skies, and I took this Iris Nebula. Uh, my conditions were pretty poor, but I ended up getting a, some nice dark dust in the foreground. And uh, the iris was off center. I was planning on doing a mosaic, and it didn't quite work out the way I was hoping. Uh, the second night conditions were terrible, and I didn't get the second paint of the mosaic. Uh, another one from Josh. This is the Dumbbell Nebula. You're becoming an, an, an intermediate to advanced imager. You want to reveal as much of an object as possible, and I know that was Josh's goal with this one. Um, he had seen an image 
that showed a lot of the extended nebula. And he wanted to do that. And knowing it's there, uh, he went to dark, dark skies. He used the right equipment, and he really was able to uh, come out with an impressive image. I'm going to give him props because I think he had more detail in the core than the image he was trying to replicate. And maybe even maybe even overall, it might be a better image. So uh, great job on that, Josh. Um, this one's by Mike Miller, who's visited a few times. And this is where we get into really difficult stuff, Reflection Nebula. M78 is about the most difficult object. We were talking about this. The most difficult object that can be on the uh, intermediate list. And you start, after this, you start getting into the really crazy objects. Advanced imagers have mastered the basics, are limited only by the skies and their equipment. They may develop specific interests, whether it be interacting galaxies, dark nebula, transits, or they may just be studying a specific region. They know what they want, so it's kind of hard to suggest what advanced imagers should be looking for. But I'm going to show off another. I mean, I'm just going to show off a bunch of what I'd consider advanced targets. Mike Miller, the Witch Head Nebula. Mike Miller, we saw this one on cloudy nights. Vandenberg, uh, Vandenberg 141. Tom Goldman, when the guy who builds your filters takes an image like this, you know it's got to be a tough object. Uh, Sharpless 308. Scott Rosen, the IFN, the Intergalactic Flux Nebula around M81 and M82. That's nebula that's surrounding that. It's just the dimmest object out there that... It, it, is just so impressive, but nobody really knows it exists, and he's done a great job of pulling it out. Uh, another one, um, the uh, Elephant Trunk Nebula is down there on the bottom left, but on the top right is a much, much, much dimmer nebula. Uh, I think I think they call it the Flying Bat Nebula, Sharp List 129, and uh, he just has done a great job of pulling out extremely dim objects. Another one, Vandenberg. 152 of, of Scott Rosen's. When you be when you get to a certain point in your imaging, you're you're finding new things. You're 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 able to pursue whatever interests you have. And one guy actually was shooting the Crescent Nebula and discovered a new object. And it was a planetary nebula that had just, it was kind of in a particular area where nobody had noticed it. And this isn't his photograph. They had to use Kit Peak's telescope to confirm it. And it's really, really dim, but if you choose to, you can go out there and commit enough time to it, and you can find this object pretty close to the Crescent Nebula called the Soap Bubble. And we've probably all read about it in Sky and Telescope because uh, it's just a, uh, a really cool story. Um... There's a galaxy buried in there, NGC 7497, and around it, the Intergalactic Flux Nebula. Scott Rosen, again, did an amazing job here. Uh, I don't know, that's just insane. Uh, it's just a, a great image. It really gives you that feeling that Alex was talking about. Um, you don't have to tell people what equipment you took this with. You don't have to tell people even the, the galaxy designation. You just have to tell people, look at this, this is, this is impressive. Another one by Scott Rose in the Vulture Head Nebula. Wow, this is this is really cool. It really shows the Vulture Head. And again, this is a reflection nebula. Uh, some of the most difficult objects out there. And he, he makes it look easy. Another one by Don Goldman. Matt Ratter brought this one up, CTB1. Never heard of it before, but uh, a larger object. And just a, another impressive one. This is my bucket list object, Einstein's Cross. And this one's by Roland Christian. I've only seen a few people photograph it. I've only seen a couple people photograph it where they got separation between the clovers uh, or the clover-like shape. Um, this is a gravitationally lensed quasar. Uh, so you're actually seeing the, the, four, the clover leaf pattern is actually the same star behind a really massive galaxy and uh, a great demonstration of the physics behind it. Um, this object is two arc seconds wide, which means the separation is less than that, is considerably less than that. So that just goes to show you how difficult this object is. They say a 20-inch telescope, been done with less, but it's probably recommended. I believe this is Seamus. I, I think it, it might be Seamus. 
but I think it's Seamus 147. At least that's what I'm going to call it. The Spaghetti Nebula, but it's these obscure targets that are out there, but uh, are pretty large and pretty dim. This is one of them that uh, just stands out. Another great one by Scott Rosen. You can you can photograph anything you want. In this image is um, uh, gravitational an example of gravitational lensing or gravitationally lensed galaxy. I'm sure you can't see it because of the resolution, but uh, if you look close enough, you can see a few streaks through it, and it's actually the the lensing going on because of the massive galaxy cluster in the foreground, and. Uh, if you asked me, I would have said, no, this is way beyond amateurs' capabilities, but people are doing it today. And uh, this is why I got into imaging, because I just love seeing this stuff. I love seeing what's what we're capable of. And um, the the only other thing I have next is uh, you're, you're an amateur imager. You uh, really want a great target, or a great, I shouldn't even say that. You want a great photograph. To really, really impress your coworkers, well, go out to uh, go out west and take a photograph like this, and uh, you're going to impress them a lot more, unfortunately. But that's the end of the presentation. So, thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Um, a little derivative there, isn't it? Um, hey, uh, are you going to turn on Adam? Are you going to turn on your uh, group chat and your um, your Q and A? Because there's, uh, there's two Just questions here, yeah. that, have been, that have been running over there. Uh, I'm going to go down to Q&A first because, uh, because Jürgen uh, Korbyshinsky uh, has asked, is there a website that you guys know about with narrowband objects with the relative or absolute amount of HAO3S2 imaging time needed? Anybody know one of those? By chip, uh, chime in or either on Q and A if you're over on Q and A, or on uh, comment section if you aren't. Let's see what else we got over there. Somebody, somebody else just popped. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you're gonna get the imaging time needed. It's gonna take some kind of. It really is gonna take some extrapolation. I mean, you, you know, I don't know if you, if you've tuned in previously. Uh, a lot of us that are doing narrowband are finding that uh, you really have to expose for unreasonably long times to get sky-limited exposures. Um, for example, my SCT at F8, two hours would be appropriate. Um, so even if you're at like F4, uh, 45 minutes, it, it probably isn't going to give you, isn't going to be overexposed. And, and it depends on your filters, of course. Perhaps it depends on your moon conditions. But I don't think you're actually going to get a firm answer like that. And I think with narrowband, a lot of the time it's just going to be longer individual subs and enough to get your stacking to work, get your your uh, stacking algorithms to work. Yeah, does anybody else have any ideas where one can find hints as to which narrowband objects do what? I I've been around narrowband for a while, and I really don't think that there's anything that, that tells you that. There's just so many variables that you just don't have control over. That when um, you know, to tell another guy, I think everybody just runs it as long as their mount can possibly handle it, and it's not a, at all unusual for people to be running half-hour exposures on everything. So um, anyway, uh, the second uh, question that has come in is about the. That you made a comment uh, at some point about um, your polar alignment has to be good enough. We're talk back talking about the beginners, I think. And uh, there was a discussion going on on the side over here about just how good is polar alignment. And uh, John, if you want to unmute yourself and explain what you were going to be saying there, you out there? Yeah, you're unmuted. Why don't you go ahead and talk? Sorry, I was kind of half listening. Say that again. Hi. Yeah, why don't you say what it is that you were talking about over in Q, over in uh, the group chat? Oh, about the the drift, uh, the alignment. So, uh, someone asked, you know, what's good enough? And in my experience, and I think I've just kind of maybe transitioned from beginner to intermediate recently here. Um, in my experience, a good polar alignment is one where it's not affecting your guiding so much that it actually impacts the quality of your image. Um, you can spend a lot of time 
dialing in really, really good polar alignments. But after a certain point, there's just a diminishing effect. Um, and so you should you should dial it in enough that you know, and you, you should know your how you know how your guiding system performs. Uh, do you struggle with certain things, whatever? But if you can dial in polar alignment well enough that it isn't creating a large enough error that your guiding has to constantly fight against it, then I would consider that to be good enough. And uh, I, for my equipment, I think this may be equipment dependent. I found that around one arc second, a little less. I'm sorry, one arc minute or a little less is usually good enough for my setup. And once I get it there, I don't worry about getting it tighter because there's a very diminishing effect. I mean, it can help. And uh, if I'm if I have a really unruly declination axis, and sometimes I do, I'll spend the time to dial it in under 30 arc seconds, uh, and then I can usually just kind of let it drift. And for five, eight minute. You know, exposure just not going to affect the stars in those exposures without guiding deck at all. But usually, my declination axis these days is behaving, and a one arc minute polar alignment is usually good enough. And again, this is going to be equipment specific. You know, if you're working with a long, you know, longer or shorter uh, guide scope, uh, you know, if you're, you know. There, there are countless variables that could affect it, but you kind of have to know your equipment. You have to know what's good enough for you. I don't think it's just. I don't think I could just say, "Go for one arc minute, and you'll be good enough." I don't think that's um, that's sufficient for everybody. Um, comment comes in about um, um, whether it whether it has to do with light pollution or not, as far as the quality of the skies. I think it has a more a somewhat more to do with. Um, um, uh, the shakiness of the skies. Uh, if you've got good solid sc seeing, then it's better to have a better polar alignment. But if your seeing's not so good anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't think light pollution itself has much to do with the uh, uh, quality of your polar alignment. Um, I agree with John that the, your polar alignment is good enough when it's not affecting your image. Uh, but if you see your stars Take, making arcs, well, duh, that you're definitely across the line. Um, so it depends on how long your exposures are going to be, uh, what your image scale is, and all that kind of stuff. If you know before it actually shows up, um, is there a number that I would put on it? Um, yeah, when you're imaging pretty long focal lengths and stuff like that, and you want everything to be good, uh, uh, oh, five or eight. Arc seconds, I think it is. Is uh, is it? Yeah, it's five or eight uh, arc seconds. Is is you should be getting down there someplace. Um, so anyway, um, I do see sky limiting. Tim, is that yours? Your question about sky limiting. Um, that's about light. And then you asked about light pollution. You're not talking about polar alignment anymore. You're talking about sky um, background sky. Contributing to a picture. You want to answer that, Adam? Yes. You, okay. Tim's comment. I, I think okay. this is kind of from what we kind of talked about a couple episodes ago about sky fog limitations. Um, how long you have to expose, or how long you should expose for a particular sky fog level. And there's actually math for that that Josh did in a previous video. Yeah. Basically, you want. <clears throat> To be, you want that to be the limitation as opposed to the noise levels. Um, you basically do have to go kind of the math to see it, but w what ends up happening is you're separating your target from your sky from your noise levels, and you're able to properly keep them separate as you're processing. I think is probably the best way to to put it. Um, there are a number of sky um, uh, exposure calculators. And they tend to run on the same philosophy that you only want a, your camera has got a certain amount of read noise no matter what happens. Your camera's always going to put out a certain amount of noise. And then there's the wanted signal, the, the photon noise coming from the actual um, image that you're shooting. And you want that to get way up above um, your background read noise. The way you check your read noise is to go off in the background someplace where it's nice and dark in your picture and see what your ADU or what your exposure level is. And um, every camera has got an ideal background level. And so you can specify with the various exposure calculators, uh, um, you can specify how long you have to go to get above that background level. 
or if you're running a DSLR, um, you check your histogram to make sure that it's separated from the left side. So that, then that means that you're pretty much up above that background level. Um, and Glenn, yeah, uh, it depends. Glenn, if you're using a DSLR, yeah, it is getting it up there. That's, that's an easy way to look at it. If you're using a CCD and you can actually measure your background sky glow, um, then you figure out what that is. On my QSI, it's supposed to be at 1350. On my ST7, it was supposed to be at, 11, at least at 750. And if it were at uh, half of 750, I needed to expose twice as long to get it up above that. That's all it is. It's not tricky. Um, there is a question in uh, the Q&A side. For, small, for some of the smaller targets, do advanced users start using IP projection between, between the tube and the sensor? And uh, he assumes that it'd be difficult. And I don't think um, IP IP's projection. No, uh, I don't think many advanced users are using it. There's just kind of a, a clunkiness to it. Uh, first of all, you're you're reducing your f ratio considerably. Now, there are uh, premium telescopes that will have built-in optimized barlows, which still correct the field well and um, will give you higher, re higher resolution work uh, or higher uh, focal length, longer focal length work. Um, but I don't think eyepiece projection is really an advanced technique. I think it's probably an older technique that was kind of modified from planetary. And uh, now with DSLRs and SCTs and that, we, we really use the telescope at its prime uh, focal length. Uh, or reduced as opposed to uh, bar load or magnified. Um, at least that's basic telescopes, I think. Uh, some of the premiums have dedicated bar loads, like I said. And uh, now I'm jumping back over to chat, so now I can read what you guys were really saying. I see there's some discussion about the Astro Tortilla, Polar Align, Glenn Newell. Uh, how many times did you try that? Because I found Astro T Tortilla's Polar Alignment to be, every time I'd flip the Meridian, it would give me a different reading. And I, I don't know. First, that was my first time trying it. Yeah, I used to, I would take like two or three of them and then kind of average them out because I'd get a slightly different reading when using it a few times. Well, what I did was I, I did it, and then there's this other tool that you enter the error into it, and it slews your scope by just that amount. So, like, you would go on a bright star and then enter, slew by the amount of the error and then adjust your mount to bring it back into the, to the center and then redo the Astro Tortilla, and that's when I was getting the, the uh, what I thought was one arc second. It was like 1.06 arc second. 1.07 altitude arc second error after doing that process. Oh. Sounds like it's getting easier and easier. Yeah, and I didn't have to wait 15 or 20 minutes for, for a drift align. Just does it in two two exposures in Astro Tortilla, so like 20 seconds plus the processing time. Yeah, I was using Astro Tortilla for the last few months before I got my CCD and I was I thought it was awesome. It's free program, it's amazing. Um. Yeah, I started out my day one when I first started in February this year using Astro T. I never tried doing any kind of sky modeling or anything like that because I'd uh, I heard a lot about it when I was looking for a mount on the mounts forum on cloudy nights. And everybody said get Astro Tortilla. So I tried it out on the first day. I uh, had some trouble getting all the files to download once I finally got that working thing just modeled my sky and pointed me right where I wanted to. I, I was pretty amazed by that. I thought that was the coolest thing. Yeah, it really makes you uh, think about the mounts that are now coming out with pointing models and uh, say, okay, well, it would save me a minute <laughs> if the mount had a pointing model built in, but Astro Tortilla doesn't take so long. Uh, Sequence Generator Pro doesn't take so long to frame. So well, the downside is none of us, or at least I'm assuming, none of us have any visual observing skills for finding anything because we're just depending on our plate solvers to do it for us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
That's the truth. I, I, I'd love to buy one of those little two ninety nine dobs, but I'd uh, never be able to find an object. Um. All right. The uh, <clears throat> I'm going to post the uh, chart with the four, uh, with the fifty objects uh, in the Google below the Google session. We lost this one earlier today, so uh, the original one is gone, and the new one will be posted. Um, and we can amend it if anybody has any suggestions for objects to go on it. Uh, I hope you got. I hope you found a lot of the. Uh, I hope you find them useful. Maybe you can refer to it when you're struggling to find that particular object you're looking for. Um, I knew it was going to come up in the Cloudy Nights post about the Orion Nebula and how it's a, not a great target because it has lots of dynamic range, but I think uh, we, we've kind of had that discussion before and we kind of had thought it through and I think it's, uh, you might repeat that, but you might also think about it and kind of disagree. So. You know, something that's really bright like that, like uh, M17 or, or, or uh, I'm sorry, M8 or, or the Orion, where your, your subs look really good just by themselves, uh, you know, that's an indication that, that you've got something that's going to be pretty easy to process and, and work with. So I think, it's, I think it's a good one for beginners, and I count myself as a beginner. Um, you know, when you've got that much light to work with, it, it really makes it easier. Yeah, when you're a beginner, you don't quite know what you're intending to do. And you may be using your camera as an electronic eyepiece. And I'll tell you, I was amazed when I hooked it up to my computer and just the individual subs coming in. Like, I was literally jumping up and down. Like, I can't believe that I can see this. This is amazing. Um... I think the Owl Nebula had to stretch a bit further, but um, I've pretty much everything impressed me. Um, anyone else have any comments or questions um, in regards to the topic? Or any questions unrelated to the topic? Hey, I have a question about your exposure times, Adam. Go you, ahead. You, you showed several uh, beginner images, and then you moved on to later where you had the narrow band images. And uh, I, I'm just curious if you could speak to the exposure times, like when you started, how long were your exposures, and then later on now, how long are your exposures now? Um. So the first photo you saw was probably 15 to 20 seconds, or the first few photos you saw were probably 15 to 20 seconds, because I started in Alta as uh, on my, uh, it's a CPC 800. Um, and I'd say I shot with that for a couple months. So you probably saw 10 or 15 photos there that were all 20 to 30 second exposures. Then I got my wedge, and wedge unguided, uh, if I got lucky, I was able to hit like 45 seconds, but I usually didn't get lucky. I was pretty much still stuck at that 30 seconds-ish exposures. Then I got guiding, and then at 180 second exposures, um, most of my presentable images, I would say, came after I got guiding. The ones that I said were bad, but I was happy about were the ones pre-guiding, whether it was wedge-mounted or... Uh, just in Alta as, and my most recent images, all the the bright nebula images that I took, that I took, my exposure times in H alpha were probably 20 minutes, and my O3, uh, well, right now I'm imaging 20 to 30 minute exposures in H alpha, and 40 minutes to an hour in O3. So you can see as you as you get more advanced, your exposure times go up. Um, if you can, if you can happen to get the exposures times up, you, you want to because you're just going to go deeper. And I didn't break each individual photo down by exposure times. Honestly, I wish I had a lot more time to do this presentation. Uh, I'm feeling much better this week. I don't have a cold, but my son and my daughter were really sick this week. They were actually in the hospital a couple times taking blood, so 
wish I had more time to do the presentations, but that took priority. Um, but uh, any other uh, questions? Thanks. Thanks for your effort this week, Adam. It's hard to get all this stuff put together, but good job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to see a, a talk on uh, PhD and the advanced settings. And I, uh, I spent some time this week with the simulator and, and got some really good results for the first time uh, with the simulator running, but uh, I haven't had enough clear skies to see if that actually translates into something in real life, and, and I've spent a lot of money on different uh, parts of the auto guiding, and uh, I'm wondering if you know going back to the Orion mini guider is, is just as good as the or better than the some of the longer focal length stuff that I've, I've tried to throw at it. So I'm sort of struggling with guiding right now. What what's your what guiding camera and what setup do you have now? Well, I have both the uh, original Orion Starshoot and the the new Pro one, and I have the Mini Guide Scope, and I have a Short Tube 80, and I also had a, a f 6.3 500 millimeter mirror lens that I was using, but it uh, it's too touchy focal wise. Um, but it just seems like. Um, you know, and I've gone through different rings and, and everything, and it just seems like the, the more I struggle, the, I don't ever make any progress. <laughs> mm -hmm. Still just, uh, you know, bouncing is around it, in there. Is it a bad, it's a bad stars, bad graph? Bad graph. What do the stars look like? Um... The stars are, are okay in the in the center, out towards the edges, and I, I am using a focal reducer. And I also have a, a field flattener, but uh, I had to take that out to get the to have enough back focus with the when I added a filter wheel. Um, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, are you using the new PhD PhD two? Yeah. All right. Uh, it's, that would be a good topic. Uh, I, uh, you might, for your own particular problem, you might uh, get some help posting on Cloudy Nights because a few people might be able to just kind of help troubleshoot you through it. But um, PhD2 would be a good topic, and uh, especially, I, I think there's a new version coming out any week now. Um, I don't know what the new features are in it, but it's supposed to go along with the new Sequence Generator Pro. Um, so... Well, I know they're working on Multistar, which would be pretty awesome. That should get rid of a lot of the scene issues. And, and I think that's the, the biggest thing in the way it's set up now is you're, you're pretty much chasing scene all the time. So learning, at least with the default settings, so learning how to adjust the advanced settings so that you're, you know, doing a lot less guiding. And I was able to do that with the, with the simulator, but I haven't had enough clear skies to... Try it for real. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember the last clear sky I had. It's been a while. I have fog here. It's been a rough year. It's kind of like the year of weather from hell. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, we do have six viewers out on the uh, YouTube channel, but I want to thank you guys for coming. I'm going to end up stopping the broadcast now. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, I will post the topic. I believe I know the topic, but I want to confirm with the uh, presenter. And I'll post it shortly. And uh, thank you for coming, but uh, today's session is going to end now.